Yeah. Okay, uh, so I'll be talking over the next few minutes about some of the work that we've done as part of the NERSC NESAP project. Uh, that's the NERSC Exascale Science Applications Program. And uh, the idea behind the NESAP program is that as NERSC, as NERSC was planning for its CORI Phase II system, which is powered by the, uh, the Intel uh, Knight's Landing architecture, we wanted to make sure that some of the more commonly used software packages would run well, efficiently, scalably on that architecture. And so there are 20 different software packages that are a part of that NESAP program, Quantum Espresso being one of them. And so what we wanted to look at were things like the scalability of, of Quantum Espresso to large numbers of nodes. That's what I'm going to largely be focusing on. Uh, then uh, I'm sharing my slot uh, with Thorsten, and he's going to go into more detail about some of the work that we've specifically done uh, on targeting the KNL architecture itself. Um, and so what we've really focused on as part of this project is the performance of hybrid DFT calculations in Quantum Espresso. And so, of course, this is a matter that is of increasing interest to the scientific community. Um, but at the same time, hybrid DFT calculations often remain prohibit prohibitively expensive. The primary difficulty, of course, being that when you do a hybrid DFT calculation, you have to perform uh, lots of integrals that look like these in order to calculate the uh, exact exchange potential. Uh, and so this is uh, a set of integrals that is doubly indexed over the bands, bands i and j, and so you have to calculate a number of these that uh, scales quadratically with the number of bands in the system. And this is a, a very significant computational cost. Now, uh, before I go into some of the things that we've done in order to try and ensure that uh, this part of the calculation scales well, uh, I want to just focus for a little bit on uh, how Quantum Espresso currently, or, or at least prior to our changes, parallelize these calculations. And, and you know, as a number of people have said already, Quantum Espresso supports multiple forms of parallelization. Sort of the baseline default is plane wave parallelization, but there are also other forms. Uh, for example, task group parallelization, which is applicable to uh, local and semi-local functionals. Uh, and then band group parallelization, which is somewhat similar, which is applicable exclusively for uh, exact exchange calculations. And these are, are good and, and um, optimal use of, of task groups and band groups can be very essential to getting good performance out of these calculations. So you know, here I'm showing a calculation on 64 water molecules. And what you can see is if I do just a, a PBE calculation, so no exact exchange here. And uh, then I, I just used purely plane wave parallelization running on 64 nodes on Haswell. Then um, that doesn't necessarily give me uh, as good performance as I could get if I used an optimal number of task groups. I can get something like a factor of two. So task groups are pretty useful when you're using local functionals. But then the, the uh, analogous case in which I'm running with PBE zero, so I've, I've actually got exact exchange now, and I scale from uh, not using band groups to using band groups, and you know, you see it's a dramatic difference. We're talking about well over an order of magnitude difference between if I just use purely plane wave parallelization versus using an optimal number of band groups. So, so it's it, essentially important that we have good band group parallelization. Uh, that having been said, there are some limitations to the way band group parallelization works currently in, in Quantum Espresso. And you can kind of see that here, where I've got, a again, a calculation on 64 water molecules. And I'm looking at the strong scaling as I use more and more nodes. For all of these calculations, I'm using one band group per node. And what you can see is beyond about 10 or so nodes, we really don't get uh, very, very much. I mean, you hit a, a point of diminishing returns around there. And so if we look into why exactly is this and what are the current limitations of the way that band groups work, um, then it, it's actually kind of clear if, if we look a little bit more closely at what's going on in the code. So here what I'm showing is uh, a, a sort of crude overview 
of how a calculation using exact exchange works in quantum espresso. So you've got uh, each of these ovals is meant to represent a loop in the calculation. The outermost loop on the left here would be uh, like a Davidson diagonalization. And so, you know, in that loop, you're iteratively updating the wave function. And then within, um, w w within these other three ovals, you see loops that represent uh, the calculation of the exact exchange potential. So, you know, as I showed you on uh, a, a couple slides ago, you've got all of these integrals that you have to calculate indexed over bands i and j. So, uh, just like you would expect, you've got loops over i and j. You also may have to account for k points. And the way that band group parallelization works in quantum espresso, uh, at, at least prior to our changes, is it's really only this innermost loop that uh, is parallelized with respect to band groups. So uh, what happens is you end up assigning a certain set of bands J to each different band group. And then each band group performs a calculation on you know, that subset of bands within a band group. Uh, the, the band groups will use plane wave parallelization. But then aside from this, you know, in, in all of these other loops, uh, everything is essentially duplicated across band groups. So you're basically doing everything outside of this loop uh, more or less in serial with respect to band groups. So if you're using 100 band groups, you're doing all, all of the work uh, out here 100 times over uh, for each different band group. You know, you're doing all the work, for example, of the, what, what you would be doing in a local or semi-local calculation 100 times over. Um, and so this is kind of one of the, the key issues that we wanted to address. Um, and, and one of the first things that you can do is you can just recognize that um, we can extend parallelization with band groups to at least this outer loop i if we just recognize that you know, one way you can use band group parallelization would be to parallelize just over bands in the inner loop. But another way you could do it is you could imagine saying, instead of uh, distributing bands, I'm going to distribute pairs of bands. Um, and so that's what we did. You know, we, we said, uh, we're just going to, to figure out the, the proper load balancing to distribute a set of bands i and j to each different band group. And uh, in doing so, now both the, the i and the j loops are parallelized. And, and then we also change uh, the way that Quantum Espresso prioritizes which, uh, which band groups get which sets of pairs so that you're primarily uh, iterating over loop i before you iterate over loop j. That just makes for better efficiency, less duplication of work. And when you do this, uh, and, and you know, I, I'm for lack of time, I, I'm skipping over a lot of the details. There are some complications when you do this. I'm glossing over all of those, but you do have to be very careful about what this does to your memory management. You can end up, uh, you know, ha if you don't do this very thoughtfully, you can end up using much more memory than you should. But anyway, we, we dealt with all of those issues, and we get, you know, noticeably better and uh, better performance. So for example, here I'm doing a calculation on 16 water molecules. And you can see the strong scaling of QE 5.2 versus our improved code. And there's a couple things to notice here. First of all, just the overall scaling is better, as you would expect. Uh, we're, du we're duplicating less. But also, you can notice there are some interesting points where you get these sort of discontinuities in the, the old code. It happens around 32 nodes, and then again around 62, uh, 64. And the reason for this has to do with the fact that when you're doing uh, parallelization over bands, you can only distribute an integer number of bands to each uh, different band group. And so if we've got 64 uh, uh, band groups in the, or 64 bands in the system, then you know, you've got some processors with three bands, some with two. Uh, and so you've got a load balancing problem. 
And when you instead parallelize according to band pairs, that largely goes away. Um, you know, to put that another way, when you're parallelizing over bands, you can only efficiently parallelize up to uh, having a number of band groups equal to your number of bands. When you do this band parallelization, band pair parallelization approach, then you can scale much, much higher. In principle, we can use a number of <laughs> band groups equal to our number of bands squared. Um, but now, even having dealt with this, there's still this matter uh, that we're performing everything outside of the exact exchange calculation. In other words, all the stuff that you would normally be doing in a local or semi-local calculation, we're performing all of that serially with respect to band groups. And so we might ask the question, does that really matter? You know, obviously exact exchange is much, much more expensive, and you expect it to be two, maybe three orders of magnitude more expensive in many cases. So we might think, well, maybe that's OK. Maybe we can just get away with duplicating all of that work outside the exact exchange part. And so we looked into this. And what I'm showing here is the fraction of time that you spend in a calculation on uh, 16, 32, and 64 water molecules. As you go to larger and larger numbers of nodes. And what you can see is, and I'm, for all of these calculations, I'm using one band group per node. And what you can see is, as we go to larger and larger numbers of nodes and larger and larger numbers of band groups, what actually happens is you end up spending a large majority of your time doing the local parts of the calculation, everything that's ordinarily you would expect should be really cheap. Um, and, and we actually hit a crossover point uh, pretty early on where, where you're actually spending a majority of the time doing that part of the calculation. And, and this, of course, is just because of the fact that as you're going to larger and larger numbers of nodes and no, larger numbers of band groups, you're parallelizing to an increasing degree the exact exchange part, but not the local part. And so we wanted to address this issue. Um, and the obvious way to do this is to just say, OK, fine. Quantum Espresso supports parallelization of the local part of the calculation. And it has various mechanisms to do that uh, pretty well, including task groups. And so the, the sort of obvious solution one might imagine without too much thought is, of course, what we should just do is say when you're doing all that, uh, that stuff outside of the exact exchange part of the calculation, all the local parts of the calculation, then what you need to do is just use all the existing uh, mechanisms for parallelization that already exist in Guantanamo Espresso. And then when you jump into uh, the exact exchange part of the calculation, only then do you start worrying about band groups. In other words, let's just go ahead and parallelize everything outside of the, the exact exchange calculation exactly in the same way as we would if it weren't an exact exchange calculation. The problem with that, of course, is as, uh, you know, and, and as Stefano noted in his talk, these different parallelization methods make different assumptions about the way that data is distributed. So for example, quantities like psi and h psi are distributed between processes in different ways, depending on whether you're using band groups or not using band groups. And so if you're, if you're not using band groups, if you're just doing a local or semi-local DFT calculation, then the expectation is that I should have quantities like psi distributed in such a way that each different node or each different process is going to have uh, a subset of the g vectors for all of the bands. The problem is that when you use this par parallelization method that we're using, or, or even the old method, you have a different data distribution. And in our method, what you really want is to have all of, you, you want the nodes to have all of the G vectors for a subset of the bands. And if you want to do this thing I suggested where you perform the local part of the calculation where you just pretend that you're only doing a local DFT calculation, 
then you have to somehow be able to convert between these data structures, and you have to be able to do that efficiently and on the fly. And I won't go into any of the details of how we did that, except to say that it's an extremely complicated process and thousands of lines of code are involved, but we have written it such that you can do this. You can switch between these data structures on the fly, and what that means is you can perform a uh, hybrid DFT calculation where you're employing totally different parallelization techniques for the local and the, and the, the actual exact exchange part of the calculation. And among other things, that means you can now use task groups along with band groups in the same calculation. Task groups will affect parallelization of the local parts of the calculation. Band groups will affect parallelization of the exact exchange parts of the calculation. And when we do this, what we see is that we get vastly improved strong scaling. Uh, there's still some room for improvement here, but we're looking at something like an order of magnitude improvement uh, overall. And then if we just look at the exact exchange parts of the code, uh, that's actually looking pretty close to ideal here. This is for 64 water molecules. Um, and then just to give you an example of sort of a more real world situation, um, one of the things we're interested in is water on a platinum surface. I couldn't run even an, a single SCF calculation of this using the old code. It was just too expensive, but I did use a, a sort of half-sized system. That took about 40 hours with the old code running on 64 nodes. Uh, with our improved code, we've cut that down by about an order of magnitude. And then our code is totally compatible with ACE. So throw that into the mix, and we're about two orders of magnitude better than uh, what was achievable a couple years ago. Uh, and so we've got lots of different applications that we're currently working on involving MD simulation and EB calculations and so on and so forth. Uh, and so what we've seen is, you know, we've greatly improved the strong scaling of hybrid DFT and quantum espresso. Uh, this leads to an order of magnitude or more improvement for a lot of calculations. And uh, we're currently working on getting these incorporated into the, the main development branch. Uh, and if you want to know more about the details that I skipped over, uh, these two papers, this one especially, uh, goes more into, the, into those details. Thank you, Taylor.